I would say in my language, which is in silk chain. Um, you know, we talked to you the other day kind of about just a lot of the history and kind of unpacking that in a sense. And I um, guess we'll start off from there <laughs> and talk about more of the future of what it's going to look like going forward. But I want to bring you to my origin story, which is for the Okanagan people, which would be up into Canada, around here as well. And Martin Louis told it. So you could probably find this online. Um, okay, so this is Rose, which around here we have Woods Rose or Nutco Rose. Um, how you say that it is Skookui. Skookui. All right, sweet. <laughs> so, if you notice of the rose, each petal is in the shape of a heart. So, what is that called? The signature of all things, or the doctrine, doctrine, doctrine of all things? Yeah, doctrine of signatures, where you know plants will have these characteristics, and they'll tell you what, what their medicine is. In this case, with the rose, it's the heart. And that could be spiritually, definitely spiritually, number one. Medicinally, physically, mind, everything, mind, body, soul. So, a um, long, long time ago, there was creator, Colin Chutin, and he was kind of just hanging out, you know, up in the stars, and there was this big planet, and it was all water, and he took this rose and he was like, you know, I kind of want, there should be land on this place and there, I want there to be people to enjoy it and be here. So he took one of the petals and he laid it down on the land. Maybe that became like Asia. And he took another petal and put it up here. Another one over here. Started creating the continents. So we got to the last two petals and they were twins. So we put both of them down on what would be, some people call it Turtle Island. Um, people here call it Tatupa at times. There's a lot of different words for it. So um, he put these two petals down. They were twins, like I said. And each one of these places that he laid the petals down, it sprouted out into land. And on those lands, with the rose, came a certain set of languages and laws and the people you know you got in Asia Africa you're different people for the different petals so these two came together and one was a Native American and one was a white man and they were twins and creator said you guys can be here I'm not done yet I'm not done making up like my laws for you I'm not done with your language so you're gonna just be here you know and I'm going to put these laws down in a, in a puddle. And your job is to go out here and just experience this land. That's all I want you to do. So then he headed out. Oh, and the one rule was don't look at this piece of paper. Don't flip it over because it's not for you to know. So, okay, he takes off and the native guy, he's like, hey, brother, I want to go out. I want to go, like, run and, you know, check this place out. So he, like, heads out. Climbs up on this mountain, sees an eagle, like sees all the deer and the bear and just all this like wildlife. And then he's like, wow, look at that lake. I'm going to go like, swim in this lake and just like live, you know. So then he gets done for the day and he comes back to this puddle and his brother's still sitting there. And he's like, hey, like, what did you do all day? And he's like, I just really want to know what's on this piece of paper. <laughs> like, I just got to know, you know, what, what is our language going to be? I need to know these things. And he said, whatever, like, you got to come see this place. It is beautiful. It's amazing. We got to go eat these fish and climb these mountains and do all these things and just be. His brother's like, yeah, maybe. I'll, maybe tomorrow. You know, maybe tomorrow. So they go to bed. He gets up, heads out again. He's like, come on, let's go, let's go. His brother's like, no, I'm going to stay right here. <laughs> I just still need to know. So he's like, okay, I'm going to head out. I'm going to go up, do my thing, and come back. And maybe you'll help come with me tomorrow and see how beautiful this place is. So he gets back there, and all of a sudden, this puddle was a giant ocean. And he didn't know where his brother was. 
And that one brother f had flipped over that pedal because he just had to know. He just had to know all of the answers <clears throat> to all of the secrets, you know? So he ended up going all the way over to what is Europe. So he's over there and Colin Chutin comes down to the Skalu man, the native man, and he says, hey, you know, your brother, he flipped over that piece of paper and because of that, he's now going to be way away from you. But when he comes back here, it's going to be your job to help him remember who he was and this land and where we both, where we came from and teach us, teach him our ways again and be one, be one twin. So that's one of our creation stories. And um, I think it's a really beautiful example of a bridge, mm -hmm. you know, and just kind of like how we can go forward and how we're one. And yeah, so thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> Is it too late to turn the projector on? Oh, good too late. Okay, it should be all queued up. Okay, um, so we're gonna proceed a little bit. That's gonna get queued up. That'll take a minute. We'll get to it. We are gonna talk about programs and initiatives um, and a lot of collaborative partners that we do currently have happening in the school because there's a lot of influx and there's a lot of ways things have evolved. But before we get into that, it feels pretty important to really ground into the history of the landscape a little bit, specifically with the mission school system. So who, raise your hand if you've heard of uh, Native American boarding schools. Okay, so quite a few people. So prior to the school site that we're working at currently, Pascal Sherman Indian School, it was St. Mary's Mission, which was first um, the influx of this mission system where indigenous children were taken from their homes. They were removed from culture, uh, all practices of language, tradition was completely cut off, and the whole focal point was to, was to, to kill the Indian, uh, save the man. That was kind of the motto of this mission school system. So to coincide with a lot of this, um, this mission system, it was originally created uh, in 1886, St. Mary's Mission. Uh, so like I said, a lot of these children, they were removed from their culture from very young ages, some as young as about four or five years old, um, and put into a place where hair was cut, language was completely criminalized. So what we're seeing, there are a lot of the term that we've heard um, very frequently working in Native community is this idea of intergenerational trauma that these children who grew up in this system, who all acts of being part of their culture was completely banned. Going through this generation after generation, these kids that went out into the system had families. A lot of them didn't know how to be parents. Um, they didn't know how to pass on cultural practices. And this is something that happened, it was very methodical and very strategic to have this forced assimilation that was happening all over the country, but as we know, is this has been an attack on indigenous people throughout the globe. So this form of imperialism, colonization, these were all tactics. Attack food-based systems, attack language, decimate culture, and have severe punishments for these people. So when we get this down the line, when these kids grow up, and when you go through, through enough generations that these native people will just become US citizens. They'll be able to plug into the system and all any aspect of culture that they had will be completely removed. So I know that's pretty heavy, but that's also real. And that has been the authentic experience. And is the, the people and the families that we work with, this is something that is still currently happening. So the mission was founded in 1886, but the tribe didn't actually take control of this until 1973. So there are stories of colleagues that we work with who went through this mission system who have really undergone the utmost degree of atrocity that we're not going to describe here. And so, I don't know if anybody wants to add anything to any of that, but well, we'll leave it there. We, we, we could, we could yeah. say that they have been unearthing you know, sort of like mass graves of, of murdered Indian children at these outside these schools. That mm -hmm. there was, you know, there was outright murder. Yeah, so like for Cam, that resisted. Cam Loops, that first school where it kind of uh, took place, this very first unearthing. Um, 
that was the dialect of our people here, you know, because as we said this other day, that there was no um, border. So that in Selkchin dialect ran from here all the way, you know, five hours north. So there are people in this community who have survivors mm -hmm. or relatives that have survived that, yeah, that residential school. My mother-in-law and all of her siblings went to... And so now the mission. count is, I think, 7,400 something the last I looked the other day. And, and that's just in Canada. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's just what we're aware of. They have not even begun to scratch the surface of what actually happened in the United States. Mm -hmm. Is it 7,400 people that went to the school? No, no, no that no. they the bones of children that were unearthed. Unearthed from mass yeah. And on the scratching of that surface, if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure. They're using LiDAR technology to find the mass graves before unearthing them. Yes. Yeah. And so they've only, they've like found mass graves at almost every place they've yes. looked. They haven't looked at most of the places yet. So when that number like 7,000 hits you and you're like 7,000, it's just a fraction. And the, the methodical way that that was done, like there's almost no chance that the vast, vast majority of every one of these missions has one of those mass graves, yeah. or possibly multiple, I don't the know. The grounds that we teach on has uh, a cemetery on it. So I don't, I mean, most schools that you go to do not have cemeteries on them. So no. that's that. So it's it's that's it's one piece of a very very large story um, that's been perpetrated on Black communities on Latino communities is this forced relocation and assimilation. So utilizing education, the school system, to really kind of weed out any aspect of authenticity or culture to try and create this this monoculture, this homogenized system. So with not only that happening with the people, we also have a lot of the ecological devastation which is happening here. So in this community in particular, which has undergone miners coming in, the Hudson Bay, the fur trapping, the decimation of the beaver population, how detrimental that was to the landscape in itself was all huge deforestation. So all of these things. So when I came into this community and started researching the landscape, researching the people, the first people were here, which I know probably many of us, when we go to a new territory, this is probably the first thing that we're doing, is we investigate who were the first people that were here, what was the language. So we kind of fast forward to what's currently going on. And walking into this school, I've been an educator for 13 years, I have never worked at a site that has more soul and more innovation in my entire life. So going from a mission system where language and culture was completely banned, where it was literally beaten out of these children, it has now become a beacon where these children are learning their cultural practices, traditional ways, and language on a daily basis. So let's just take a moment. So the tribe took control in 1973 and we're a tribally controlled school and through all this the decades that have passed there's been so much healing that's taking place and someone who did not grow up in this community as an outsider who's really relatively new to working and serving an indigenous community it's incredible to me that this this school is housing all of this trauma but simultaneously all this hope and that's something when I work with these kids the lifeblood of this program, which I'm going to talk with you about, that gives me more hope. That's the reason I wake up every single day, is seeing what these the legacy that these kids are carrying and all, all the good change and all the work that they're going to impact in the future. So do you want to add anything? Okay, here we go. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the different programs and initiatives that are taking place because there's a lot going on. There's a lot of people who want to work with the school, who want to work with the kids, want to work with the teachers. Um, so specifically, this program, Nature Immersion, I've been running this program for the past decade and it started in Salinas, in East Salinas, which is the migrant farming community, which I know a lot of you are aware of. And I always feel very called to tell the story of how this program started because it started with one young woman. Her name was Frida, and it was about 2013. 
And Frida um, lived in Acosta Plaza, which was a very dangerous part of East Salinas. And her family were Southsiders, which were Sorenos. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with gang culture, but if you grow up in a family where that is ingrained, then that is the expectation that you're going to carry that lineage. And it's very difficult for these children to actually exit this. So many of our children in East Salinas, it was very common for them to carry weapons with them because they would oftentimes have to defend themselves on the way to school. So this young woman had a knife with her and she was harassed and sabotaged by these young men uh, around the corner and she tried to defend herself with this weapon and she was then expelled a week later. So that really sat with me, was just the hypocrisy of that situation that we're punishing these children for a situation and an environment that is really beyond them, that they cannot help. So one year later, Frida came back. Her mom advocated that she was going to come back to the school. So we had her back in. And I was running kind of this wilderness skills program and just starting to get into kind of like debris huts, like you know, shelter building, friction fire. And I remember we were teaching bow drill, and I handed Frida this knife. This, the very literal and kind of symbolic representation of why she was excluded from this system. And she kind of retracted and looked up at me, and her eyes just filled with tears. And I gave her the knife with complete trust and just complete confidence in this young woman she was going to become. And I just watched her for the next couple hours as she just kind of sat with this weapon, this, this whole reason that she was excluded, and just kind of whittled away. And what I got to see was the whole evolution of this young woman, of seeing how much it makes a difference when someone really sees them, when someone puts trust in them and recognizes the communities that these kids are part of and some of the situations which are completely beyond their control. So that, watching her growth with being able to utilize wilderness skills and just exposure to being outside, how therapeutic that is. Just the land in itself provides its own healing. That kind of set me on the path to create this particular program. We can go to the next. Okay, so nature immersion program, um, it's basically this triad of three skills that I've been honing in on, which is ancestral skills, oftentimes called wilderness skills, uh, mindfulness, awareness building exercise, and equine assisted learning, which is a very, very critical component to this because I firmly believe, and I know a lot of us who have animals who have worked with horses or donkeys specifically, Prey species are a mirror for intention. And there's something, particularly when you're working with children who come from deep, deep trauma, these animals are able to connect with the, the, the essence of these kids on a whole different way that human beings would not ever be able to facilitate. Um, so moving along here, our kind of our, like the, the grounding pedagogy and the praxis of this program is really about hands-on experiential education. And through that, we're really organic, getting a lot of social emotional learning and place-based learning. All of this deeply at its core is about these kids forming a profound connection and kinship with the landscape itself. Uh, we can go to the next. So some of the goals of this program um, are really about um, deterring the way the origin of this program uh, was highly specialized in working with at-risk youth. So a core group of kids in Salinas who people didn't want to work with, who they felt were dangerous. These kids were in gangs. These kids were experimenting with drugs. They came from these communities um, where people didn't know how to communicate. So a lot of this program, the early stages of it, was really about acting as an opportunity for a mediation, of building these healthy patterns of communication, alternative forms of behavior, and giving them outlets. Because what I found the commonality with all of these kids is they didn't have humans in their lives that were able to provide mentorship, but where they were lacking in relationships in the human form, they could form deep, profound relationships with animals, with waterways, with trees. And for someone like myself, who had some pretty life-changing experience around those things, I was able to go talk to these plants and these animals when there was nobody else out there that could understand. So uh, we can move to the next slide. 
Let's go to the next one too. These are just some pictures of them. Okay, so just some of the core, um, I've been talking about like kind of pedagogy, like the teaching, teaching methodology of this program is really about experiential. It's about getting the kids this kind of hand on, hands on practical work. We blend in kind of this theoretical component, but that's really at the core of it is experiential education. Everything is anchored to place-based learning, which includes seasonal learning. Everything we do is kind of directed by the seasonal calendar. It's all anchored to the resources that are there and available to us. And it's really about this reciprocal teaching and learning model. So as much as I'm there providing mentorship opportunities and kind of facilitating for these students, they're also teaching each other. We're creating this kind of turnover mentorship amongst their peers where they have an opportunity to become experts and knowledge keepers in this. Um, it's entirely learner-centered. So unlike kind of the public school system where we kind of, kids get left behind if they're not understanding things, we're moving at a pace that's conducive to them, so they're grasping it. Um, and there's also an emphasis on the soft skills, so mindfulness practices, doing a lot of sit spots, focusing on bird language, um, that's kind of another component, all of which to kind of create like uh, these altruistic communities, um, some of these core principles are empathy, compassion, reciprocity, and equity. These are kind of these core principles that I'm really working with with this program in particular. Um, we can go to the next slide. Okay, um, so the structure of the program, I teach um, sixth through ninth grade currently, and I see them once a week for 90 minutes, and each week I'm embedding a new skill. So we might be learning about um, bow drill fire making, or currently we're teaching a wild crafting unit. So the students are learning how to make elderberry syrup. Um, they are learning about animal processing, processing deer, filleting salmon, um, making meals from scratch based on things that they're foraging. Um, animal tracking, we can kind of go down the list in terms of the different primitive skills that could be offered. So beyond that one 90 minutes once per week, we do one field trip per calendar month where we really get to get into this immersive environment and go into a lot more depth than we could otherwise than the 90 minute session. The students also have the opportunity to participate in equine, equine based learning or equine therapy. So we're partnered with um, a tribal member Casey Nissen, um, who's a renowned horseman, uh, suicide racer, if you're from the area, um, who has the Indian Relay Race team. And he has started a program called Cayuse Communications, which really deals with um, promoting leadership qualities uh, and connection with horses. So Casey will come to the school, and he brings about 15, 20 horses, and we set up kind of a mobile <laughs> pen. And the kids will go out there for two hours a couple times a week, and they're working with one horse that they are forming a very deep relationship with. And he's providing guidance and kind of basic training. Um, but that's more or less like that element, particularly with kids who uh, are a little bit more closed off and not responsive. I've seen such profound work done with horses in particular, which is one reason I've started to recruit my own herd of animals in hopes to team up form collaborations with other tribal members. So we can start offering this as kind of a mobile free service for any students on the res and across the community. All right, I think. All right, we'll leave it. Yeah, that's good on the PowerPoint. The rest is just data, it's kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you want to talk about it? Okay, so uh, <laughs> I was telling someone earlier uh, Sarah is very <laughs> organized and like uh, she sounds like she's a college teacher and I'm like flying off the cuff and I kind of sound like I have like early onset Alzheimer's sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that. <laughs> if I'm like closing my eyes, I'm like, look, I said I was looking in my cabinets, for, my brain cabinets for the word I'm trying to get. But uh, <laughs> so sorry. Um, okay, so I. I think a little bit of context, I, I just like a little bit of background context. So um, I was homeschooled. I did not grow up in a traditional um, education system. It was largely project-based learning and we did all kinds of crazy stuff. And so uh, 
that's really cool because our school is trying to do a lot of project-based learning and I have no problem with adapting kind of some of the things that I want to do into that, that model because that's the way I was raised. Um, we were very, very, very poor. Uh, there was five kids and uh, we lived in poor areas. I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, um, largely around minority groups. I remember hearing um, when I was younger that black people were a minority and I just couldn't figure that out until I got older because I was like, they're all my neighbors, I don't understand. And I didn't know that there was whole states that didn't have um, other people that weren't white. <laughs> Uh, so um, that was my background um, growing up but my sister so we were again very poor which translates into uh, commodities and really crappy food because that's what you can afford um, when my sister was about 20 she got leukemia and the first time she got it she did chemo and the second time she got it she said I'm gonna go natural and um, so she was doing different natural things we really 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 started looking at food uh, how that affects everyone but particularly poor people because they can't afford to go get food that that helps what my boyfriend calls when he talks to the little kids our little soldiers in our body fighting those things like cancer and diabetes and heart disease um, so we really started changing our lifestyle as far as food to the best that, that we could. And um, she ended up, the cancer got better, but she had ulcerative colitis and she went septic and she passed away. And I was pissed at the government because I, she couldn't get the health care access she needed because um, the government, it's, it's illegal to treat cancer with anything but chemo and radiation. So everything she did was under the radar and she couldn't get stuff like antibiotics because they would try to forcefully admit her into the hospital against her will. <sighs> so, Standing Rock happens and I'm like, yeah, government, down with the, like, I was so pissed that the, the, the government can take away things that can help save people's lives because they want to make money and that the government can put pipelines through people's water sources. I was just so upset. So I went there um, and that's where I met my partner. And I, I had kids when I was young. So uh, I started college when I was 30. And when I went to Standing Rock, I was in my last like two quarters of college. So I knew I was going to, I lived on the coast. So I know I was going to move over to this side, but I didn't know where. And I met my partner at Standing Rock, and so I made a lot of connections through him. And so I moved to um, the Cogswell Reservation. And before I even moved, I had a job at Pascal Sherman. So that's how I got to Pascal Sherman. Um, I thought that I wanted to be a nurse to help people. Like, I, I think I said that earlier. But then I was like, screw that. Like, let's just fix it before the problem even starts. Um, so I did a lot of work with the Conservation District in Pierce County, mm -hmm. doing gardens and gleaning projects. So I've known for a long time that that's, we grew up having gardens, and that was one of the big, you know, things that we had that was healthy, that, uh, you know, growing up. And I wanted to, I didn't want to stay on the coast and teach people who already had access to some of those those things, those community gardens and those, those good foods, I, that was already being done there. So I came over because I, it's not being done as largely over here. Um, I ended up working at the dorm for a little while and then switching to uh, teaching at Pascal Sherman. And seriously, the second, I, I always tell my administration, I, I know I'm really annoying. <laughs> I know I am. Because I, like, that is what I want to do. That is what I was told. Like, like this is, like, what you're supposed to do. This is my passion, is teaching people, but kids, because they're going to carry it on, how to, how to garden, how to grow their own food, how to be healthy in that way. Um, and then there's a whole piece of sovereignty that is just on top of everything that's awesome. But uh, I've been bothering my administration since the get-go. Uh, they said no at first, 
because of bears. But then we got a new administration who wasn't afraid of bears. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I was like, we can build big fences. Like, we can do it. We have so much land. And uh, yeah, I'm just really annoying. So I wouldn't stop until they said yes. So in 2018, we started, um, I got the permission to start doing little things to make money. Um, I did a little fundraiser and uh, we, were, we were set to do some of the garden work and then uh, COVID happened. So when COVID happened, we got a lot of money because the push is to go outdoors. So I got to change from being a classroom teacher to the outdoor education teacher. And um, I'm like, what, three months into it. So <laughs> I don't have slides and like I do have some pictures and stuff. Um, <clears throat> the, the actual garden part is not going to start until like February. We're getting a greenhouse and we're gonna start the gardening portion of it. But what I've also fallen in love with, especially here and with um, my partner and, and just other people who've been teaching me is the, is the wild side of it and the medicine side. So we right now have been going out and getting elderberries and sumac berries and rose hips and and just like trying to do like plant knowledge and ro like rose hips. I'm not trying to teach them all of the things because I'm afraid, you know, like we don't want them to try to go cure everything. <laughs> They'll, that would be bad. But, uh, well, no, that wouldn't be bad. We just, right. they need to be older <laughs> um, to learn all the things. But like the rose hips and the vitamin C. So we combine, um, Morgan and my partner, he's the language and cultural instructor at the school. Um, they'll come in and like do this, tell the story of the rose hips. And so we, we, we do that piece of it. And then we talk about the health benefits of the rose hips. And, and then we went out and harvest rose hips and we dried them. And then we made tea. So they got like the whole picture. So the first um, quarter is like, wild harvesting. The second quarter will be wild crafting where we go get the tools from nature and then we can make, um, I love making stuff. We made stuff homeschooling. So I always entered stuff in the fairs and we did wild and crazy things. And so I'm taking that and using it with the kids to uh, make gifts for Christmas. So we're going to go harvest things so that they will all have stuff that they can take back to their families and give as gifts. And then the, the next... Um, portion will be um, the gardening and we'll, we're going to do verma comp or vermiculture and uh, we're going to do a hula culture bed and we have raised beds and yeah so that's what um, my program is it, I'm also going to do uh, food preservation um, I don't know they're just going to have to give me more time <laughs> I don't have enough time to teach all the things that I that I want to teach them but Hopefully, maybe we're going to have some classes after school where I can even teach the adults um, canning and preservation methods and stuff. So when we do have these gardens and that garden idea spreads and everybody has a garden in their backyard, none of their food goes to waste. And they can keep every single bit of their hard work and use it later. Uh, so we, we kind of touched on earlier, we have a lot of really awesome initiatives and collaborative partnerships that have been um, bubbling up for some years now. So the Nature Immersion Program with Pascal Sherman, we just started and launched um, a multi-year beaver habitat restoration project working with Colville Fish and Wildlife and the locally based Methow Beaver. So what we're really trying to explore is these two paradigms of Western science, indigenous knowledge, and seeing where the threshold is of kind of elements of synchronicity, elements that these parts could be working together. So building in stipends for elders to come in and talk about some of the original waterway systems, to talk about what the landscape looked like, kind of uh, not pre-colonial time, but kind of um, relatively kind of pre-contact. So we have Methow beavers coming in. We have Methow natives, which we've been partnered with for some years, doing a lot of creek restoration. Uh, 
We are just starting, which I'm very excited about. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Queer Nature, Pinar and So. Um, if you don't have their Instagram account, I highly recommend following them. But I'm going to read this just because if you get a chance to read any of Pinar's um, musings or essays in any capacity, it's just, it's so beyond beautiful. So Queer Nature is a decolonially informed queer ancestral futurism organization. So they're teaching ancestral skills with um, a queer, trans, and BIPOC lens. So their specialty is really with working with um, these marginalized groups with queer kind of trans children, doing rites of passage, stealth craft, bird language, animal tracking, medicine making. So we're going to be working with them in the spring um, with my eighth and ninth grade students in hopes that we may also start a multi-year collaborative partnership with Queer Nature of designing one-of-a-kind curriculum that can create and take nature immersion to the next level of moving just beyond ancestral skills and creating an academic fusion. Um, which is kind of something we're experimenting with at the school currently. A committee that I'm facilitating right now uh, is working on a pilot to indigenize our curriculum, where we're creating culturally relevant, culturally informed um, practices that are interdisciplinary in content and blend in a lot of these ancestral skills. So we're finding ways to take uh, the experiences that these kids are having outside and to bring it into the classroom to make it academically relevant in this true kind of experiential format. Um, so those are a couple of the things happening at school and I could rattle off a whole list of partnerships but currently with Nature Immersion those are really kind of the big initiatives that we're working on. Um, so how I kind of came into the picture, I started out working this year for Rob Crandall and we went to a seed or nursery. Uh, yes. Was that yesterday? Yeah. Yesterday. Um, <laughs> I think so. Um, and started working with Rob, uh, for years, worked for different farms in the community, Villery Garlic, 8th Street Greens, just kind of like staple farms in this community. Um, I've always known that I wanted to work with plants, with food, and just kind of revitalizing these like sovereign traditional food systems and creating that for, you know, my people back home. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in Hawaii just, you know, seeing the way that their um, culture is so held up on this like very high importance. And so they're doing a lot of this work. and. Um, I got really inspired by that. I was like, wow, like this, this is it. Like I need to go home, you know, I can finally go home <laughs> and feel good about it. Um, so coming back here and just like working these different like odd jobs with different mentors mm. and farms and um, hoping that I found a place, you know what I mean? Cause I feel like when you get into plant work, like it's, it's not this like set path ever, you know? And like the deeper you go with plants, like the further they're gonna take you. And that's something that I just like love about them so much because I feel like the more that I'm open and I surrender myself to this work, the more they just keep teaching me that I know nothing. <laughs> um, so, okay, that's a little bit my backstory. Then I started working with Rob and he had uh, a partnership through this Native American Agriculture Fund grant um, that I'm now kind of directing and working with Val on. Um, so he was a partnership and has been working with Pascal Sherman for years to, yeah, do some creek restoration. Eight, 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 yeah. yeah. So, and then having a, you know, also we all kind of have this like dream of, of a native garden, of food accessibility, of setting up traditional food systems. Um, so that dream, uh, I like to like think of it of like we're all these like weavers of one basket, you mm -hmm. know, like we all are, are weaving this together and all really need each other to make it work. Um, so he was going to school on Tuesdays and doing really fun like plant identification and I have a lot of traditional knowledge with plants um, and then just blending that and you know, he's very Western and I'm very not Western in a sense. So we were able to kind of like combine this teaching that's in Silk Chain and Skylu and, you know, Western botany and all of that goodness too. So from there, I met Sarah and Val and they were just like, well, this is great. We all need to be working together. And, you know, we, we work well with each other and 
um, then they offered a position for me to work like four days a week at Pascal Sherman doing outdoor education with them and um, being a part of that program. So <laughs> that's just a part of kind of the work that I'm in right now with trying to create traditional food systems that are going to be lasting for generations. Um, you know, one of the models that I like to look to is the Muckleshoe. I've said that before. If you have the time, please research that Super because great. the work that they're doing is just phenomenal. It's been going on for 10 years and um, they have a fresh berry bar. They're eating, you know, seafood. They're eating elk. I think they said now buffalo. Mm -hmm. um, they have it They in work their with schools. local hunters. They, you know, and then they also created grants to pay uh, native farmers to start growing food mm -hmm. for the school. So this is just like such an expansive idea. And, um, how do you spell that? What was it? What word? Muckle shoot. M U C K L E shoot. Okay, thank you. You're down by Auburn, Washington. Yeah. And that's where Valerie Seagrass, we mentioned her yesterday. She's done tons of work there and has written a ton of books. So, food sovereignty, we all kind of understand that, that term, right? You know, we indigenous people love the word sovereign, so <laughs> I like to stick it in there whenever I can. Um, <laughs> Heck yeah. Uh, I can't remember the exact definition of it, but it's like systems that are designed, in, integrated into your culture. Um, so that looks like, for me, berry harvesting, putting that away, drying, you know, my people in my family hunt or fish, you know, whatnot. So putting away food for winter or even gathering for ceremony is something that I like to do because we have winter dances here still. Um, so that looks like digging roots, bitter root, camas. And these dances have a lunch and a dinner and a breakfast and dinner is at night, lunch is in the middle of the night at 12 and then breakfast is in the morning. So at these different dinners, like at dinner, your foods come out in the order that I guess is a, I wouldn't say a hierarchy, but in the way that it comes out almost seasonally mm -hmm. or traditionally of importance to us. So, you know, that would look like siat, which is service berry, deer, salmon, and bitter root. But then also, you know, there's this, you know, fry bread on the table too, which like fry bread is not a traditional food. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, people are like, oh yeah, I love fry bread. Oh, Indian tacos. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, they're, they're yummy every once in a while, you know, but that, that's not something that should be a staple. It's a genocide food. Mm -hmm. It was brought to our people when all of our foods were being taken away, we were pushed onto a reservation and told, you cannot go out to your gathering grounds. You could be shot for it. Um, yeah. And then having sugar, flour, and salt, and baking powder, whatever, you know, replaced. And then that becoming the food as your main source. So that's where you see, you know, why we have the highest heart health problems, heart diabetes, addiction, like sugar is addiction. Mm -hmm. Alcoholism is a sugar addiction. So, you know, all of these, a lot of these problems stem from an attack on our food system and our language. And so I guess what I'm working, what we're trying to do is recreate our food system in a more modern way that's going to support the local farms and create you know, a lot of our food goes to Seattle from here. So in order to support our farmers and keep our food here in this valley, I think is so important. I'm from Okanagan, which is just like 30 minutes over the mountain. Winthrop is pretty, or the Met House like has a really good food system program. But for us, like on this garlic farm that I work for, all of our garlic, all of our sweet potatoes, all of our squash, all of our onions, like this beautiful food is not even touching our supermarkets at all, you know? So people aren't, seeing what real food is they're not tasting it and they can't afford it you know people native people aren't going to go to the freaking farmer's market and go pay three dollars for a potato or something you know what i mean like it's just so so that's kind of the accessibility and what i think is just so important is like we got to start growing it we got to start supporting our local farmers and we have to work together as a community in a village which 
that's how people survived here. You know, that's how it worked. That's how we actually had enough to get through the winter time. So that's that grant and there's money there to work with elders. So I have connections to some basket weavers and just different people from Wenatchee to Nespelum and whatnot and trying to bring them in, whether that looks like going out and harvesting in, which is Indian hemp or tulis to make tule mats or, you know, maybe cedar bark even to just do like flat basketry, which is coastal, but we've adopted that as well. And it's easier than doing a cedar root basket. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just, yeah, having this very forward looking idea of how do we design something that's going to last for future generations. And that's what that grants about. What do you do with your garlic and your onions and all that stuff that doesn't go to the market? Where does it go? Uh, when I was working there, we would take it home. Some of it would go to food banks, and then I would try and um, get it out to different schools as well. What time is it? We got time. <laughs> but 8, 18. Okay. some of it was seed mm -hmm. for our own stuff that wasn't, you know, pretty enough. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Did you have a question? Is, was Pascal Sherman a person? He Pascal was, Sherman was yeah. a person. He was a. Um, uh, I think he was Wenatchee. I'm not yeah. Sure. He, he was very educated and went off and did education and then felt like now he wanted to come back after he got his education to. Um, help in the community in, in his community and I'm that it's a much better story than that but that's mm -hmm. what I remember <laughs> yeah Dr. Pascal Sherman was one of the first people on the Colville reservation to earn a doctoral degree and he spent a good portion of his livelihood being out in Washington DC as a political advocate when in a time that none of this was happening mm -hmm. specifically during the termination period which um we're not going to get into because that's its own thing, but the termination period um, as kind of suffered by the Klamath River tribes where ultimately the federal government came in and convinced them to sell off their tribal homelands um, for, for compensation, for money. So by the time that money was divided up, majority of families got very little. So let's say it was 40, 50,000, which was, doesn't go very far and was spent very quick. So it was another tactic for the government to purchase and own and manage resources of native land. So the termination period um, was highly controversial on the Colville Reservation and very divisive, um, where families were turned against each other because some people on one hand believed, yeah, we, you know, we, we want to be U.S. citizens. We, we want to have our resources be developed and this money sounds great. But the other hand, Pascal Sherman was a big champion of anti-termination, was saying, we can't have this. If they come in, they're going to do the same thing to us that they did to the Klamath tribes. And we lose all forms of sovereignty because when that land is gone, it's gone. So the termination period lasted for decades. I want to say anywhere between like 30 or 40 years from the 1940s, 50s onwards. Um, but he was one of the few people that was really out there advocating and pushing against that period and for tribes to hold on to their land. So hopefully that answers that. Hi. We're going to pivot. College teacher, early all set. <laughs> We're going to pivot a little bit. Um, <laughs> other than just kind of, you know, talk, we could talk about a lot of these things. But we really want this to be very discussion oriented um, and very engaged. So a question that a lot of us have been mulling over through the duration um, of this experience here, but just in day to day, is the issue around accessibility. How do we create accessible opportunities for things like permaculture, primitive skills gatherings, whatever it may be? How do we create opportunities for queer, trans people, black people, indigenous people, people of color to feel welcome and to feel like they can afford these opportunities. Because more often than not, this is a very vulnerable space for people to step into. It's one that's very intimidating. Mm -hmm. And it's one that's full of, a lot of times, microaggressions, where people, although very well-intentioned, are not aware of the statements that they're making and how incredibly hurtful and triggering that can be. And I know that these conversations 
um, with Black Lives Movement and whatnot, these conversations are happening all across the country. But this is something that I invite each of you to really dig into and to think about. If there are points of our dialogue where you are becoming uncomfortable and settled, I invite you to sit with that and to really think about where is that coming from? Where does that discomfort come from, or the vulnerability, or the defensiveness? And how can we start to gradually unpack that so we can build these bridges, this collaboration between all these communities where people do feel welcome, they feel like they have access? So here's my question to you. What's, what do you understand by the term accessibility? What do you understand by the term accessibility? So I would like you to turn to the person next to you and just have a talk. What do you understand by this term? OK, over to you all. There was a lot of good discussions happening. Yeah, good job. I was like, whoa. This felt so good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all, everybody's buzzing like little bees. What did y'all talk about? I know, I'm excited because like it took me a long time to get to this point, but my very last point in this like dialogue was coming from the idea of like a brittle landscape and that you know the white fragility as a cis white older guy um, recognizing my own kind of brittleness and how can mm. I feel safe in a welcoming community, whether that's with you know BIPOC folk or folk that are not cisgendered and or perhaps the more than human world. Like how do I make myself feel safe so my fragility isn't so toxic? Hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm. how would I write that down? Yeah, yeah, just put brittle <laughs> brittle landscape. Fragility. Fragility. Yeah, fragility. Fragility with white fragility. fragility. Dealing with fragility. Resilience. Ownership of fragility. Yeah, ownership of fragility, I think, is. Oh, ownership of I, yeah, for sure. Just maybe ownership is like a good kind of, you know, one of the big pictures. Because none of us really own anything, right? Maybe other than our own name. All right. I keep forgetting y'all are up there. <laughs> Although it scared the crap out of me the first day because all I saw was feet coming down. And I didn't even know there was anything up here. And I'm all can't walk and there's like toes dangling. And I was like, oh my gosh. Anyway. I think they're my toes. Birdie? She's owning Yeah. Um, one thing that came to mind because I do very similar work to what you're doing and mm -hmm. just knowing how often people are reaching out to me asking if I can or if someone I know can be an outdoor educator for them. And we're all swamped because there's like such, there's a higher demand than there is like a supply for teachers who know how to do this work. Um, so I think just like teaching teachers mm -hmm. would allow this to become a lot more accessible mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways. And also that accessibility, yeah. you know, you need to come in so many different angles. Yeah, so totally. Mentorship, would that be? Yeah. Teacher training. Teacher training and mentorship. Yeah. So if we kind of just back up a little bit and just um, thinking about kind of the, the term accessibility and kind of so we can unpack that a little bit. What's meant by accessibility? Yeah. Ariana? Um, I'm not really sure how to put this in a package, but like the, the experience of humility when you realize how much you don't know about other people and mm. uh, how can you make things accessible, how can you bridge someone else's life experience from your own, um, how important it is to be humble. Mm. Accessibility through humility. Humility, connecting life experiences. That's what I'm hearing you say a little bit. To like paraphrase. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ariane. Um, when I think about accessibility, the first thing that comes to mind is the identification of barriers. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you want to start with like the idea of acknowledging who's missing, but sometimes you can't even identify who's missing. Mm. And so um, knowing that you're always missing somebody, somebody's voice is not being 
heard or at the table. Um, and sometimes you know who's missing, um, but sometimes you don't. So looking at all of the barriers that may be in existence to, from keeping people not at your table. Um, and so the barriers can be wide and vast, but also very specific, like um, financial barriers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like, there it is. Transportation. Um, yep. Language. Um, time. Yep. Um, so, yeah, and the barriers can be wide and vast, and so I think the identification of barriers and then the act of removing those barriers creates accessibility. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. I've been waiting for the yep. transportation mm -hmm. financial mm -hmm. aspect of it. So thank you. That's one of the big things that I've been like has anybody read the Alexi Sherman book? Um, what uh, Sherman Alexi? The uh, Diary of a Yes, love that. Okay, there's one part in the book where he says, we were on the reservation, and we were really poor, but then there were these white people, and they were even more poor than we were. And I was like, oh, that was me. <laughs> like, <laughs> poor. You don't understand. You know, I think there's sometimes this thought that, oh, well, you know, capitalism and money and blah. Like, we don't even want to pay attention to that, like, we need to think of other things that don't have to do with money. But, like, if you don't have money, that's all you can think about. And that is one of the biggest barriers to bringing people of, of all kinds into, like, this collective is money. I would never, my school paid for this. I, I wouldn't have been able to come here if not for my, the generosity of my school. But, like, that in and of itself is a privilege. Like, there's other people's, people that don't have that. There are other people who could be the teachers who don't have the access to get the things that they need to be the teacher. Maybe they have the knowledge, but, like, you got to have the certification or you got to have the, the piece of paper. Like, I, mm. underestimating the power of money to impact accessibility and, and how that works in, in this, in, in all systems. I think is a big deterrent to like recognizing the the potential that we all want yeah. for this. Absolutely. Nice. Yep. I think Kenny's that one. Um, yeah, I uh, I've just been thinking about you know you ask what do you mean by you know what is accessibility, and then sometimes I think it means different things to different people, mm -hmm. um, and so as a white woman privileged you know a lot of it for me is about the having access to to other people you know having access mm -hmm. um, I organized a oh, circle wow, we call it the intercultural mm -hmm. intergenerational dialogue circle we couldn't yeah. find a name but the people we pulled people from all different backgrounds and different ages and it's a very diverse group of people and I you know I, I'm sitting in a circle and realizing you know I would never normally have access, air quotes, whatever, to, to, to have conversations with these people because we just don't dance in the same circles. Yes. And I learned so much, you know, and to be able to just hear the different perspectives. And so from my, my perspective, you know, as a white person, I might be just having access to, to, to being able to, to have deep conversations with, with people from different backgrounds. You know, that would be yeah. one idea. Absolutely. So maybe sure. I'm thinking in that terms, maybe more powwows, more things like that, where, you know, it's very welcoming and it's not, I don't know. You know yeah, what I, I mean? a lot of powwows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which used to happen here, but anyways. But then you were talking about like public gatherings. Yeah, so more public gatherings. Yeah. Um, our group, this kind of ties in with Penny's comment. Our group talked about like access to information. Mm -hmm. uh, like a lot of us found out about this course through an email list or a social media thing, which somebody living on a reservation might not have email or access to Facebook. So just how do we increase our networking with other communities mm -hmm. so that they would even know about a course mm -hmm. like this? Absolutely. Um. 
All right, we'll go here. You two can go. do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You can go. You can go. You can yeah, Rock, um, paper, scissors. <laughs> physical, like uh, physical and um, physical access. Yeah. You know, like what is the site if you're having an in-person situation? What does the site look like? If you're having something online, is it being translated or, you know, is it um, being transcribed? Mm -hmm. For, um, and so, yeah, um, the accessibility in that way. Um, and then that can also lead into language, you know, is it being mm -hmm. translated? Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, like if it's in person, then the site, like what is the access? physical access into the places where all the resources are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Skeeter? Um, Ada's already working, uh, she's already putting together a, 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 I guess a kind of a permaculture course in some way with, uh, with uh, African black people and, and uh, native people here, probably doing it on the res. And she's like, she's determined to pull this together. She's like, uh, She's um, <laughs> gonna make access happen to yeah. you know, and, and just really wanna, you know, I'm very pleased that she's here, and uh, when uh, you know she, she applied for a scholarship and and the you know the the I didn't know who she was, but when she when her line that I'm the only black farmer in Snohomish County Heck was yeah. like okay you're in, <laughs> <laughs> but she's really bringing you know I'm just really pleased to have. Some a bit of diversity in this course. Some courses don't have very much. Uh, of course, there are courses that really are aimed at these different sectors, you know. And but uh, but th but they're they're more rare. Um, one I just put on the Northwest Herbal Fair, um, and I said right up front that you know all Native people are are free of charge because we have reparations to pay. You know, because coming from the colonial culture, and uh, and then so I got some feedback from some African people who they said, "Hey, you know, we've been wrong too. We owe we got you got some reparations there too. You should make this open to all BIPOC people, and as a you know the the, the 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 free admission." So I said, "Oh, yeah, you got a really good point. Okay, free admission for all BIPOC people." And I have a, a, a black friend named. Angali from uh, Ghana and Nigeria and she so she really went out there and she was our liaison and she really brought a lot of, of, of uh, diversity to the to the to the event and so one thing that she she so she's been teaching me I'm really pleased to have a teacher and she said that, okay well you can offer these scholarships but you got to make a nice a place for them to hang out together that's a safe place because they're going into a culture a lot of them don't even want to go to your thing because mm -hmm. they're going to feel like too much other and and so you got to make it feel safe uh, have a, so we have to create a place like their their own hangout and she says it's got to have some sides and things so that we have a little bit of privacy yeah and so this year we did wet but this next year we're going to make a nicer one a bigger one and give them you know give them a nicer space and we brought in um a woman named Shade. Um, um, Blank and the last name, but Shade is you know a black woman who's doing a lot of this the work, and she came and gave us. We made her one of the keynote speakers to talk about the you know talk about uh, what uh, Africans have contributed to uh, herbalism because we're an herbal conference, and uh, and then they had a uh, a workshop that uh, that we paid for. We paid for her to come that was only for BIPOC people, you know, it wasn't open to the rest of the crowd. And they had like 30 people there and had a really, a really nice uh, get together. So you need to provide a place that they feel safe. Yeah. You need to have a, they need to have, usually a lot of times you want to have them in groups to say, oh, we have one black person coming here, one of the, it's like, they don't like feeling like the tokens, you know. <laughs> tokenized, and so, yeah. And mm -hmm. so it, it's really nicer to invite whole groups a community, you know, that they can support each other, especially like teenagers. You know, like you say, oh, we we open this up to teen. Well, they better you better have a, a crew of them, yeah, so that they feel <laughs> yep. that feel comfortable <laughs> together. So I'm just learning a lot. I'm well, I'm learning a little, but I'm 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 in the process of learning more about this. So.
thinking. I want to add one that a mother brought up to me last night was um, child care. Child care. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and, and we, we did try to look at that this look at that for this and it just wasn't uh, yeah it, it just didn't really uh, come together this time but yeah that would be another one and when I think of the word accessibility I really think of exclusion mm. uh, <clears throat> abandonment uh, will I fit uh -huh. So for some it's accessibility and for others it's exclusion. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think that was a little bit along the lines of what I was mm -hmm. referring to in a bit. Ariel had a question first. Oh well I wanted to bring in the um, term from Bell Hooks, uh, mm. interlocking systems of oppression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's really important to identify uh, the historical context within which any uh, event space or any question of access is occurring. Um, and then the other um, part to that, uh, I guess, would be uh, invitation. Mm -hmm. I've yeah. feedback that invitation is really important. Mm -hmm. That's very, that's very true, the invitation. Like, I can only speak from a, um, low-income perspective in, in that way but being personally invited to something like a broad invitation to everyone like well that's not to me like I'm too poor for that like they don't want me around they don't like that's for the people who have the money for that and I don't even want to go on you know a scholarship like that's weird I'm just a beggar like just from my perspective but having somebody be like, man, it'd be really awesome if you came. Like, reaching out and going that extra step of, like, a personal invitation is is huge. And it's very comforting. And it, it takes part of what she was talking about, like, the exclusion out. Because now yeah. it's not, like, you're, you're like, double breaking down barriers. Because it's, it's just much more welcoming and warm. And, and kind of takes a little bit of the scariness away. Because, like, well, I was invited. It's not just, it wasn't a general invite. I was invited. Kind of what I also heard you saying a little bit, that on, like, the flip side of offering, like, scholarships and whatnot, is sometimes it could feel like a charity case. Mm -hmm. That there might be that misinterpretation, that even though it can be well-intentioned, um, there's also, there, people, a lot of us, people have a lot of pride and want to be able to carry themselves in a good way. And our whole society is, is governed by money, by financial status. And even like in communities that I've worked in, like when the families get a little bit of money, the first thing they're purchasing is material goods. So they feel like in some way, shape or form, they're accomplishing the quote unquote American dream. So there's that, that very real facade that people still feel like they have to embody, where there's that people want to take part, but they also don't want to be another charity case. Yeah. And don't get me I wrong, keep offering scholarships. <laughs> we offer scholar, you know, diversity scholarships, and I want to say we make it wicked clear that it's not charity. Yeah. Because we're not doing it specifically for them. We're doing it for us. Yeah. We're doing it for the richness of the course. We're doing it to have the diverse voices in the conversation, especially about permaculture, and that it's critically important that we hear their, the perspectives of people of color and BIPOC people, and you know, queer, trans, mm -hmm. you know, people that we don't normally get to hear, we don't get to hear their, their voice. That's kind of a little bit also what I was kind of, yeah. that's why I organized that circle, but in, in scholarship things, we're, we're doing one on our online course, and we make it clear because we need the perspectives of For the sure. diversity of people. And if people can't afford to take the course, we want them there. Well, like I was saying, the financial part is huge. And so, like, yes, totally offering scholarships. It's just, I think, kind of going along with the invitation and just, like, all of it, I think there's just a piece that you have to like make known like this isn't a handout like the you yeah, are it really you important. are important and this isn't just like our 
like, ugh, we oh, gotta so, have the, so noble, yeah, yeah. yeah. Take a few more. Yeah. All right. She hasn't had her hand up. Oh, yeah. sorry. Um, I have, like, I, I think like, another community that has a really hard time with accessibility is, like, people with physical disabilities. Um, mm -hmm. And so, actually, physical accessibility, I think, also has to do with a lot about, like, setting um, physical disability and also, like, hearing, visual, those kinds of Absolutely. things. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> Um, I think Leo. Who was next? Leo. <laughs> Leo. I saw Leo. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, for me, what comes up is, in at least in my experience, is kind of a lack of resource on how to bring accessibility to our camps. Mm. I've always made it like pay what you, like nobody turned away for lack of funds and that level, but as we're seeing, that's one little part. Um, and so in the community, knowing people that we can call who aren't, and like pay them or whatever, but not having to try to ask the community that I'm trying to invite, like how to invite them. Yeah. And maybe that's the way. I, I think that that's not a bad idea, yeah. like, because every community is going to be different, and maybe that is part of the way. And on this kind of a level of, like, how we're having this conversation now, it's so refreshing to have this conversation, and I feel like I'm learning a lot from this. Mm -hmm. um, so just in the event producers or the teacher community, <coughs> the permaculture community, that, that resource. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for me, it's like I almost put a question mark. I'm like, how do I learn more about mm -hmm. How do I have the, a strategy around accessibility, yeah. perhaps? Mm -hmm. you know, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. Hold on to that. Yeah, we're gonna that's really where we're going to unpack that. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Maybe let's do just a couple more people, and then we can kind of get to this next portion. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna go like. Oh man, like maybe people okay. who haven't okay. spoke. Well, what I was okay. noticing was coming up for me is accessibility to a, the heart space yes. between mm -hmm. yeah. people to feel the trust mm -hmm. to, to enter into those deeper conversations yeah. that need to happen. Yeah. I, I, I struggle with that. I would. Of any input on that topic. <laughs> yeah. That's really valid. Yeah, because people are coming from, you know, either, you know, guilt or, or trauma or just whatever their experience is. So there's a barrier, you know, it, that person is not accessible because of whatever experience they're coming from, much as I would like yeah. to, to reach in there. Yeah. Sort of the relationship. I'm sorry. No, it, I'm just looking at the relationships between heart space and some of the other words that are on there, like humility and exclusion, and um, and how you know it, it fits in, in in safe spaces. You know. Mm -hmm. it, there's, I really love the word heart space mm -hmm. and how that, that fits into what we're talking about here. We all have vulnerabilities, and, it, yeah. and to some level, we all have traumas. Like, that's not a, an exclusive word. We all have something that has affected our life in some way. And whether that is financial or whether that's um, like exclusion because of race or sex or whatever, we all have something that has affected us. Yeah. And we don't necessarily have to bond over trauma or, you know, but I think if you show, I think if we show our vulnerabilities and that we aren't just in it for the the ego and the glory we're in it to make a community of people and and like 
you know, I, I don't know, like I, I'm, I'm nervous about this and, or, or I really enjoy this and just kind of like humbly and vulnerably finding out everybody's like passions and, and maybe sometimes hurts, but maybe sometimes like cool things that happen. Mm-hmm. Like you can find a connection with everybody no matter where they're from. Mm-hmm. And once you find that connection, like you're, you're in no matter what, like mm-hmm. you're, once you find a connection with somebody, then that's the, the basis of community. So mm-hmm. just like be open to finding those connections and, and know that they are there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that vulnerability. Yeah, it's willingness to open. That's the inaccessibility sometimes. It's just the fear factor. Yeah. I was going to say the barrier, like, pre-existing knowledge when coming to something, yeah. like thinking and, you know, when we're talking about permaculture and stuff like that, even a lot of people in this course at the beginning were like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't know much about this, or I don't know much about plants, or, and like, I kept trying to tell people, I'm like, it doesn't matter, like, like, because that can often be a barrier, thinking that you need to have this overwhelming amount of knowledge beforehand, where if we, you know, don't use too much lingo, and we, you know, make... Teaching accessible. Mm. Teaching accessible down the lingo. Oh. That's an accessible. Well, like ego, keeping your ego out of it, maybe. I don't know how. Well, like, yeah. like I'm mean, thinking about it's like permaculture. We have a lot of words that yeah. are just so specific and like kind of need a lot of the, yeah. background knowledge. Well, and that's language okay. has come up a lot in this. How language can act as a barrier, mm-hmm. and it does unless you're getting to like the etymology yes. of words. It's like it doesn't capture the subtle nuances of things. And then when you're mixing in like cultural differences, the once diverse landscape of languages that we had, there's a lot, there's a lot there to unpack. And I think it's okay because we're here for a permaculture course. So there's going to be lingo and there's like that, you can't escape that. But having the feeling of everybody's at different levels, it doesn't matter. There are no stupid questions like... We've literally been back there like, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, <laughs> but like I've learned so much and I think if there is just, I don't feel really, except for like that little part of myself, but I don't feel really dumb when I'm like, uh, what is that? So just having that be like a blanket feeling of like, yes, we have to use lingo and whatever, but feel free at any point, like we can kind of like... Well, in academia, there's an intentional yeah exactly language and excluding people by using lingo, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which has its own far-reaching history mm-hmm. of the academy and cabinets of curiosity, and that's also its own entity. So I'm just gonna yeah. write down the language. Um, maybe Ryan, you had a hand up. We John haven't heard from you. I already spoke to. Oh. <laughs> yeah, not to skip over people, just so if we create an environment where p- people who haven't spoke to, if we can go to them. Yeah, I was going to say around the, uh, the money issue and relationship to all of the excess money that does exist that is going towards, you know, supposedly philanthrop- philanthropic things and all that money most often being tied to some set of parameters that are being set from outside of the community mm-hmm. and like the the dissolving, the dissolution of those, of that sense of ownership of the money. If you want to give it to this community because you think that that money will help that community get better yeah. in some way, fucking do it. Don't give them a list of the hows and whys to use that money. Yeah. And so, you know, I, obviously I'm not speaking to you, and, but just finding oh. ways to communicate that. <laughs> I always and, say you, I get it. <laughs> having that be you know, having that be something that's happening in the world um, would, would be one of the things that changes accessibility for so many people in terms mm-hmm. of all the different mm-hmm. that cascade down. That's a trust. Non-profits. That's a trust thing. Non-profits. I think that's a really yeah, perfect yes. segue to the next portion of this. So we kind of created like these three tiers of questions. First, unpacking what is accessibility? Because as somebody pointed Sorry. out, there's a lot of layers to this. There's a lot of nuances. There's a lot of ways that each of us are understanding it. But we also talked about some of the limitations 
of this kind of blended into that, which organically happens. So the next portion Thanks, is it doesn't have to be all doom and gloom. Yeah. Sorry, just like one last piece of, yeah. the, of, of, a, of a different thing that was relating to the most recent thing we talked about was the, the that there is no like courage without vulnerability, which is something that comes from Brene Brown's work and just the way that we were talking about, you know, stepping into spaces and, you know, whether or not we feel comfortable there. And, and there's a lot that needs to be put on different power structures that make accessibility happen and and it takes courage from those people and vulnerability from those people to you know let go of their money without parameters but it also mm -hmm. takes courage and vulnerability for people who who are coming from less inherently empowered spaces to you know walk into that with vulnerability to be courageous and so it's obviously Absolutely. all this is multivariant stuff but yeah, for sure. Yeah. So and also, the, oh, wait, I want to add um, <coughs> education mm -hmm. up here, which we've been talking a lot about, but I just want to kind of put it in a sense of, mm -hmm. um, like, I've, I've been doing this work for a decade, and it, you know, it's taken me a long time to really get to where I'm at now, and if these kids have this access of education, like these nature immersion programs that include permaculture, soil science, water hydrology, all of these things, then they're going to walk out into the world with a, a much better understanding and a leg up on it. So mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. is a big thing. Mm -hmm. It's just education. Education as a whole. Yeah. 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 And it's not just kids. I think uh, adults, too. Did, mm -hmm. did they graduate from high school? Do they mm -hmm. have a... Uh, BS or MBA mm -hmm. or something along that line and you know if you don't have that alphabet mm -hmm. uh, but associated with your name you may feel that you're not qualified to do certain things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It decides, I feel like I'm not qualified. <laughs> well, yeah, it decides pay grades. It decides like how if people take you seriously, mm -hmm. if if you have the credentials or the piece of paper, which is enormously intimidating. Yeah, I only have one year of community college and when I tell people that sometimes they're just like, "Oh, okay <laughs> you know <laughs> like what <laughs> you know so i think that but you can work around that you know you just Literally. work around it and keep going and no, doing these things <laughs> <laughs> yeah can i add something because mm -hmm. i don't see it up there yet and i feel like it should be up there is like this notion that representation matters and if you walk into a space and nobody looks like you that you know or maybe the students may be diverse but the teachers are not or at college mm -hmm. You know, and the teachers are not diverse, but the student body is, like, that's really, that's hard. You know, yeah. accessibility needs to be, like, an invitation, and it, it, yeah. you've got to have diversity at all levels. Representation, absolutely. Without. Can I add one more thing? <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I'm not seeing yes. up here is, is hidden differences in the sense, like, neurologically queer, for example. And as people who aspire to help others gain knowledge, say, mm. we may need to inform ourselves about different kinds of learning styles. Absolutely. Or, you know, kinesthetic learners and, and find ways of conveying information so that everybody has access to that information, not just the way that we individually think you're supposed to access information. Neurodivergency. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I love that <laughs> word so much. <laughs> um, it's like the mm -hmm. confident voices in the room often yeah. take up a lot of space. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So it can be kind of like difficult to feel like I can, I, get, I, I don't elbow my way into that because yeah. it doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. um, so just like structures that create opportunities for people who have like different confidence levels. That's where we're going. <laughs> well maybe not solution. That's my like word. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna get back with um, either your small group or the person you were talking with and then the the last part of this question to kind of wrap this up and bring it to a little bit of a close towards the end is how can we create accessibility? 
So we can think about large scale, but it probably it would be more helpful, more serving to think about what can you specifically do in your communities to be taking these skills back and creating opportunities for accessibility for these queer, trans, black, indigenous, people of color, whatever, whatever the makeup is of your community, how can you create these opportunities? What does that look like for you? So let's take some time to talk. <laughs> I'll leave this here so you can <laughs> reference, <laughs> and then I'll start over. <laughs> OK. How, so how can we create accessibility? What did you talk about? He has a great <laughs> example of what he's going to do. I love it. Oh, we're coming back. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Do a sweeping. <laughs> it would be great. I mean, it would be wonderful what you're going to do. Yeah, um, well, it's not, I'm not, I don't want to be, say, like, I'm going to do it. Um, it's definitely something Jenny and I are working towards. Um, but one of the solutions, you know, I've been kind of mulling over and it kind of sparked before we even left. Um, Jenny and I own 30 acres in White Salmon um, down in the Columbia River Gorge where there's also a lot of native trauma and um, specifically our neighbor across the street, Jackie, um, she used to be married to a native member of the Warm Springs Reservation which is um, mm. south of Mount Hood and she is an incredible um, caretaker of the land and cares so much. And I mean, if she was here right now, she'd be an incredible resource of knowledge. Um, she teaches us so much and is, you know, very uh, uh, methodical and <laughs> tough on. <and>, Got uh, <laughs> it. She's become a grandmother almost for us a little bit. Um, her son Colt um, will be eventually taking over her 20 acres. He's enrolled in the in the Warm Springs Reservation. And we've been getting to know each other. He's kind of shy, obviously, you know. We're like the new young white, you know, 30-year-olds across the street. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, recreational, you know, disasters. You know, mm. <laughs> how am I trying to say this? <laughs> there's a lot of people in Hood River. Yeah. Um, bro scenes and just, um, how, what did Jackie say? Um, dis, uh a lot of uh, just the recreational sports and what they've done to mm. the natural yeah. areas, even though they all think they're doing a good job and they're, yeah. they're enjoying nature. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, we might come off as that, and we, we recognize that. And Colt is, you know, you can tell, he's, he's treading lightly getting to know us. Even when we go over there, you know, he's not really, like, engaging with us. He's in the same room. He's shy. Um, mm. The day before we left, they came over, and Jackie had just smoked a bunch of salmon and dropped it off to us. And I told her we were coming here, and she was so excited and mm. wants to know all about it mm. and wants to bring this knowledge back to our community. And she's, uh, she's pretty old-fashioned, and she's like, oh, we're going we're gonna to write a, uh, something up about you and put it in the okay. local paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Colt was standing right there, and I saw the sparks in his mind. He was excited and just talking about the knowledge. And, and so my first thought is like going back, and Jenny and I talked about this a couple of days ago, but not like being like, oh, we're going to invite all the native guys from Warm Springs, come on up, we're going to teach you all this, but like maybe starting really lightly and inviting Jackie and Colt over, or maybe yeah. doing a soil installation on their property and just start kind of working and moving the group together and not be like, hey, we're going to show you how to help, but like, yeah. Share with our neighbor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'd like to build off that. So I don't know. I know that we have Portland folks here. If anybody's familiar with Rewild Portland, mm -hmm. um, one of the things they really champion, which has been really wonderful for creating access, is the monthly free skill series mm -hmm. that they've done. So just whether it's acorn processing or basket weaving, utilizing some of the invasive species that they have there as a restoration project, like having those monthly free skill series like on rotating land pieces and public parks whatever it is what has been so instrumental so that's kind of like it sounds like there could be a correlation mm -hmm. potentially and that's a really good res she's such a great resource for you guys to know what the land looked like mm -hmm. maybe or you know just bringing it back to that original state mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So knowledge sharing. Yeah. I don't exactly. know. Yeah. 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 Again, I don't yeah. feel like I'm doing it either. And mine actually was similar. It was like bravery to like bravery to reach out and like send those invitations or reach out and ask for mentorship and so mm -hmm. their bravery in connecting with others mm -hmm. is like similar yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah thanks for sharing that yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a good one thank you guys <laughs> somebody want to Okay, so we'll do do I bravery. Heard, like, what was that? <laughs> so in small solutions, I heard like just kind of skill shares too of just offering skill share. Yeah. And bridge building. Bridge. Yeah. And kind of, I mean, it's sharing but teaching. <laughs> 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 Teaching oh, others who can. <laughs> okay, back to the top. <laughs> Slow and small solutions. solutions. Skill share. I like what you just said. Teaching others. Teaching, Teaching others you know, like so that they can. Cold can bring that knowledge. Back, yeah. You know? mm -hmm. I keep. I keep saying I. Yes, I love to teach, and in certain aspects, I feel like I'm teaching. But sometimes I just want to facilitate the the connections that will make other people go out. You know, give them the power and the, the even the, the sovereignty. Like that's theirs. The best teacher is just a facilitator. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's like what Arrow and I talked about. Uh, the importance of facilitating and designing a structure of, of discussion and mm -hmm. break out small intimate discussions or setting a tone of the vulnerability of sharing in a way that's equitable for everyone so you don't have to compete for space but yeah. it's more just like a connective space rather mm -hmm. than a competitive space yeah. mm -hmm. um, and building that into the structures and the value in not only sharing intimately and vulnerably, but also the value of discussion and feedback and reciprocity in a learning experience to take it to the next level and to embody it in your being rather than just be absorbing maybe an external uh, person talking to you yeah. that you're able to really process it together and then share because you feel more empowered in your small groups or yeah. vice versa. The going to those like non hierarchical formats where it is truly discussion based and engaged. So you referenced Bell Hooks earlier in her book Teaching to Transgress. She talks about education as a, a pathway to liberation. And one of her formats, um, kind of transformative educational praxis, is she believes in this non hierarchical structure where learning is truly reciprocal mm -hmm. and she'll place herself on a situation that is completely equitable with the students. Mm -hmm. So they feel that space to be vulnerable where trust is shared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anything I missed here? I don't know who had their hand up longer. I'm not going to be the pointer. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. Okay. Um, I wanted to speak to what Pyrolite said earlier because I've been in settings where it's felt really good to have a, a facilitator who will like kind of preface the time where people are about to shout things out or raise their hands or they'll say, be mindful of how much you are sharing um, and if you've already shared a lot, maybe kind of just sit back and just listen for a second and give some space to those who might need more time to formulate their thoughts or want to raise their hand. Um, so just kind of prefacing things like that as a facilitator can be really helpful for people to just be like, oh yeah, I need to be mindful of what I am putting into the group. Even if what I have to say is valuable, listening sometimes or a lot of the time is actually more valuable to the group. So, yeah. Having the patience to listen. Yeah. And you can put yeah. and that facilitation. I, I oh, you already got it. Yeah. I call it self facilitation. 
where you kind of, some people call it step up, step back. That's what I was thinking, mm -hmm. step yeah. up, step back. Do you want me to write now? I'm, I'm just, you know, these are back. like, you know. It's hard to paraphrase. Yeah. Which is that um, I, I oftentimes catch myself doing the same thing, uh, sort of, you know, maybe taking up more space than I need to or talking instead of listening. And I, I, have, I keep reminding myself that I'm missing out when I do that yeah. because I'm not getting the wisdom that's sitting there silent in the room. You know, like there's a lot collectively we leave on the table. Sometimes yeah. two ears and one mouth for a reason, right? Yeah. Uh oh. He put it that way. Oh. Just kidding. I thought I messed it up. So I, I really love how these are um, super deep. And I'm just going to jump to some, some solutions that are a little bit immediate and kind of what's happening to go forward. So I'm just going to write down a couple references that you can look to of groups who are trying to do this work and currently raising money to try and get land back from like Chelan Douglas Land Trust, um, areas along the Icicle River, Leavenworth. Wenatchee, which is the Pascuosa band. So let's, but you guys can keep going. I'll just write it down. So um, the land back movement, this has been happening for generations where in various forms, the occupation of wounded knee that happened in the seventies with the American Indian movement, um, the occupation of Alcatraz, these have all been, um, attempts and has now really kind of been moving momentum into an indigenous led movement which is the land back movement and there is landback.org there's actually a manifesto that you can read to get more information about what is happening but it originated uh through attempting to close down mount rushmore which is really kind of this um this pinnacle this landmark of of you know, the, the predecessors, the forefathers, the symbol of colonization. So it's in sacred grounds um, in Plains country. And this, this is really kind of where that, that movement initiated was trying to get the Black Hills and sacred grounds returned to the tribe. So this has been cropping up not only all over the United States, but all over across the globe. Indigenous communities are banding together and rallying to kind of maybe a similar degree to the Black Lives Movement, that there's a lot of momentum with land back. You'll see it in hashtag forms, on social media, but these are things that are really, really important to pay attention to. This, this construct of privatization of spaces which were once communal, which belonged to everybody. The idea of stewardship is that we're all there to, to tend a landscape, to be part of the landscape, and, and we, we, we don't have any right to take it with us when we die. So that concept of returning the land back to the people, to the commons, returning what was stolen back to the hands of indigenous people for management is a big part of that. And I invite a lot of you to investigate that and see what's going on in your communities. And if there are opportunities for returning land back to native people, what are ways that we can leverage privilege and our positions to support that, to step aside and support? Yeah, and if you feel called to do that work and want to be an educator, a facilitator, and want to work with Indigenous people, then you're invited to. I think the door is always open, and um, don't be afraid. You know, reach out. Don't have white guilt. Um, we're all trying to move forward in a way of healing and and do real work so you know yeah. offer yourself up if you feel called to yeah. and reach out